please come closer. We're not biting, and we would like to have our communication tonight. Uh, welcome to our pre-event of the fifth, it's hard to believe, fifth uh, FBY conference. And uh, tonight we're, we decided to have this color night because we had uh, lots of uh, cool uh, submissions for, for the talks for FBY. And so we decided to extend our program and have a special dedicated Scala only uh, talks night, so I hope you all will enjoy it. And um, we have, uh, I want to present our partner company at Form, they're standing right there. And have, they have prepared a really cool uh, quiz with uh, Scala questions. So go ahead there and uh, take the quiz and uh, win really cool prizes. And I hope you like their socks. Is anybody wearing them already? No? <laughs> All right. So uh, if you haven't joined our Telegram chat, do it right now. Um, everybody has Wi-Fi password. It's right there if somebody doesn't. So uh, join, we'll have all the announcements there. And uh, we'll have a small after party after the third talk. So don't go away. And enjoy, enjoy the night. And I present you our MC for tonight, Andy Rutsky. Thank you, Daria. So, I'm glad to see you here today, today evening. So, small announcement, we will have three speakers, three presentations today, about half an hour each, uh, with small coffee breaks, uh, during which coffee breaks you can, as well, I will remind you, join uh, the quiz about the scholar. But, do you ready to start? Nice. I do have a question for you. Um, who would like to, not who would like, who will uh, go today uh, to the bar? Good, good. Do you know why I'm asking this? What day is it today? Right. So it's good. It's good to see, it's good to see you here in Friday evening. Not in the bar right now. But yeah, so let me start uh, and let me introduce our first speaker, Vladimir Pavkin. Please welcome. Uh, small interesting fact about him that he never written a single line of code in Java and moved from JavaScript to Scala directly. And he going to present a topic with a core, purely functional event sourcing in Scala. So once again, please welcome him. I just need a minute to set up. All right. Good. Hello, everyone, again. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, really honored to be opening this Scala night. Uh, it's a big honor to me. And um, I really like coming to Minsk. Uh, last time I've been here, it was a JavaScript conference, so there is some progress in my career. Uh, yeah, so uh, people here are very friendly, very welcoming. I have a couple of friends uh, here, and it's always a great experience, so thanks for having me. Um, today I'd like to talk about event sourcing. Uh, I've been doing and studying event sourcing for like four years already, and uh, it's uh, really near and dear to my heart. And uh, doing it along with functional programming, which I also love, is a special treat, which is now really accessible because um, thanks to Denis Mikhailov, uh, who wrote Acor library. Yes, it works. Yeah. So uh, he developed this library so we can now do event sourcing and purely functional programming in Scala at the same time. Uh, yeah, I'm not PRing my project. It's, uh, it was completely written by Denise. Um, he's the guy who helped me uh, escape JavaScript uh, once upon a time. So 
Uh, and now I'm writing Scala and I'm happy to be speaking about his project today. Usually conferences start with some warm-up, like keynote talk, so that people can, uh, I don't know, uh, warm up, uh, get prepared, you know, like wake up. Uh, not today, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty much an advanced talk. Uh, we'll do a lot of, there will be a lot of code, a lot of like advanced concepts. So I apologize in advance for throwing you right, right into the fire, uh, right, right through the gates. So. Um, uh, otherwise, I w just won't fit into the time slot. So I usually try to avoid polls. You know, uh, they are like, they like some. They sound artificial, usually made up. But this time, I really have to ask you: Who knows uh, what what is event sourcing and how it works? Just raise your hands. Okay, good, good. A lot of people. And who uh, is familiar with MTL style or final tagless style in Scala? I can, and who can like comfortably easily read code written in this style? Okay, so I have I will have at least a third of the audience with me because I will I will say like zero words about these topics like I have no time for that so we'll just have to start with with that knowledge in the background uh, yeah difficulty level uh, nightmare so uh, yeah I view a core design principles as these uh, first of all no compromise in f uh, purity referential transparency and type safety otherwise it won't be called purely functional uh, then. Uh, Acor is not a framework, so it it has a lot of really composable pieces that you can mix and match with other parts of your application in a really simple way. Uh, next, it's completely polymorphic uh, in the effect type, thanks to rapid development of Cat's effect and surrounding uh, libraries. Uh, then it's really centered around behaviors, which is. Uh, uh, which first appeared in domain-driven design, and Acor is built uh, uh, to support that uh, that paradigm. So it's really centered on behaviors and not the data, not the like database schema and stuff. And it's really scalable. Uh, Denise put a lot of effort, uh, th really thought through the scalability part, so it's it's really good at that. So there is no limits to how you scale your application. Let's uh, quickly compare Acor to other event sourcing uh, solutions in Scala world. Uh, John Degas is uh, not here, sadly, so I'm backing him, him up in putting some pepper on lightband projects. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, the, the goal is not to say that one is strictly better than another. There are, uh, there are lots of solutions out there. I just want to emphasize that uh, Acor has something unique to offer if you value purity, type safety, and composability. Uh, as you can see, there are like really different solutions, like massive and uh, high level, like Legum, uh, or like more low level but really mature, like Akka. Uh, there is also really nice and small uh, fancy QRS library, which is sadly seems like is abandoned uh, these days. Uh, yeah, so. There is a variety of choices, uh, but none of them go full distance on the features I listed above. So uh, Acor has something unique to offer here, um, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I could go into details, like to compare and stuff, and some things could get really ugly. So this thing I never get right. I don't know. This this is uh, some something like really hard for me to get, and and this is uh, the, the thing which Acor solves much in, much in a much better way, in my opinion. Yeah, so I, I won't go in that rabbit hole. So yeah, let's go to building blocks of Acor. First of all, it's behaviors. This is like the core part. Uh, you spend a lot of time um, designing the, the domain of your application. And, and Acor helps a lot in doing that in a really powerful and flexible way. Uh, then infrastructure, it's um, unified under the word runtime, which basically offers three things. It's consensus, using ACA cluster at the, t at the moment. Uh, then journal and serialization, the way you store your events and read them from your journal. And uh, uh, yeah, wire protocol, the way uh, your comments and responses are encoded uh, between the nodes. Then there is some uh, uh, tools to do CQRS, to stream your events on the read side, to build views uh, and pr uh, other, other kinds of projections. And uh, distributed proce processing, which is uh, a nice way to spread your computations over the cluster. And all of that in the pure, wrapped in the pure, pure functional API. Uh, 
uh, let's start with behaviors. And short behavior is a kind of set of actions or verbs that you can uh, do with your entity in your domain. ACOR is intentionally focused on behaviors and not data. As I, as I said, this is at the roots of uh, domain-driven design, and it's, it proved to lead to much better uh, domain models uh, in usual, in, in, like in general. So uh, it's especially valuable in event sourcing because events are much closer to behavior um, than to like data structure, like data schema, or, or something like that. So behavior in ACOR would look some, like something like uh, tagless final algebra. Like this is mm, pure Scala. There is nothing uh, library specific yet, right? So th this is just like final tagless algebra for uh, example, like ticket ticket booking entity. You can see the verbs here. You can place a booking. You can confirm it. Like some internal system can confirm it. Uh, you can cancel, uh, expire, uh, uh, whatever. So there is uh, there is one gotcha. Uh, if you have noticed uh, an instance of this uh, algebra, right? So we have an instance. It would have to like to be to, to have some sense. It would have to keep some internal state because if, for example, we uh, didn't have any like internal state, any knowledge about uh, what booking it is, like ID or something. Uh, like if you would call expire, like what, what booking do we have to expire? There is no knowledge passed inside, right? So this thing actually represents a comment, like an instance of this algebra would represent a common handler for a particular entity. For example, we take a booking with ID 1, and an instance of this thing would allow to issue comments against this particular entity. Uh, so to make it work with ACOR, though, you will need a functor k instance, which you can get from cat staglas uh, with this annotation. And uh, you will also need an instance of a Bupical wire protocol, just an implicit thing. You can write it by hand, but there is a nice uh, default uh, uh, provided by ACOR, which is uh, generated by this annotation using Bupical uh, library. There's also one thing to note, which is uh, you probably noticed that for the effect I used letter I, not F, which is usually used, right? This is intentional because uh, the effect is not going be, to be the, your regular like IO-like effect. This is a common, special common handler effect, and we will discuss it right now. So ACOR, to describe this kind of effect, ACOR uses a set of type classes. Uh, they can mix, can be mixed and matched together to get uh, the exact behavior you want. But if you take an all-inclusive uh, package, you'll get something like this, which is called monad action lift reject. So it has five type parameters. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to you. So first of all, uh, this thing describes an, uh, a common handler effect I, uh, which can work with some lower level effect F. Uh, it has internal state S. Uh, it emits events of type E, and it can reject comments with uh, values of type R. This, this will be some kind of errors, like when comment is invalid. Uh, next, this thing extends monad. So you can compose these comment handler actions the way you compose, compose monads. This is really powerful, and we'll see it in action later. Uh, then uh, the action part, this is kind of the, the essence. It allows you to read the current state of the entity, right? So when you process comments, you will probably need an, an access, what, like what current state of an entity is. Then you can emit events. So if a comment was valid, you can uh, state that there was something, that something happened. So you emit events of type E. And uh, you can, like, reset is not usually used a lot, but th this allows you to like basically reset your progress. So if you have emitted some events, uh, you can just say, OK, something happened, and I just don't want to, this, to, these events to happen anymore. So, but this is like, I don't know. We, we, I haven't used it yet. Uh, then there is, you can reject comments. So uh, if a comment is not valid, you, you just call reject, and it returns. It, it can return a value of any type A, so it will just reject. Uh, the thing and you can lift uh, so it can work with some lower level effect f so you can lift the values suspended in f into i like uh, to uh, we'll see it in action soon uh, so th this is this is basically the whole dsl that acor offers to work with behaviors but it's really powerful so let's take a look how we would write an interpreter for uh, booking algebra uh, that that would work in event source fashion. So first of all, uh, uh, 
this thing within the clock. So we, it would need to have an access to current time. Uh, in functional programming, we just we can just call like clock dot now because it's, it's it's a side effect. So we have to suspend it uh, into into some kind of effect, and the clock j does just that. Uh, so and here I can now explain why do we need this lower level effect. Uh, we don't want uh, this clock to be uh, to work in I, because I is a really special effect. It, ha it has to work with events, it, it, it has rejections and stuff like that. So we just want a regular clock, like in I.O., on, in task, or in, in something like that. So that's why we need these two, two effects. And, and we have an implicit um, instance of our monad actually reject for the effect I that uh, has uh, some state, emits events, booking events, and uh, uh, rejects comments with some kind of rejections. Let's see how we can write a, an example handler with that. Uh, there is a lot of code, but I'll, I'll go over it slowly. So first of all, we import uh, all the methods of our DSL uh, so that it's, it's uh, easier to access them. Uh, then we write a helper method to get current time. Uh, we First we call the clock that work in F, and we get an f of instant, but uh, to, uh, we, we need to lift it into i, so then we just use lift f from this monad action lift reject to get an i of instant. That, that's, that's our helper to get current time. And, and then the handler uh, like expiration, so we have some kind of booking uh, entity, an instance of specific booking, and we just try to expire it for some reason. So uh, we can write it in for comprehension because i is a monad. Uh, it has flat map. So we get current time, then we uh, read current state. If there is no state, uh, we reject the comment. Uh, no state means that uh, booking doesn't exist yet, so it was not created. Uh, in, the, uh, in this particular implementation, this would mean that the booking is not created. Uh, but if state exists, we just get its status, uh, status of the booking, match on the status, and depending on uh, the status, we either uh, emit events, reject the comment, or like in case it, it's already expired, we just uh, do ignore, which is just I of unit. We just say like, we don't, comment is valid, we don't reject it, but we don't emit any events either, just like unit. Um, yeah, that's, that's just an example handler. So uh, this is really powerful DSL that doesn't constrain you in any way. So the full power of final tagless is at your disposal. You can write any kind of behavior you want, and ACOR will uh, be able to launch that later on a cluster. I don't have the time, uh, time to go deeper in some other topics, but ACOR is good at separating identity and behavior. This is a really cool feature, uh, uh, but yeah, sadly no time today. You can enrich events uh, with metadata, and uh, beha since behaviors are in final tagless form, you can run, run natural transformations to get some really cool stuff, like some additional functionality. Next, uh, the runtime. So if you take the popular Onion architecture, the um, uh, runtime uh, is uh, an infrastructure layer. So behavior is at the root, it's at the main layer. Runtime. Uh, is infrastructure. So behavior doesn't know anything about network, uh, uh, databases or stuff. Uh, all of that is pushed into runtime. And as I said, three components of it, it's uh, uh, consensus, it's uh, uh, journal and serialization, and uh, wire protocol. Let's see how you can deploy behavior to the runtime. Uh, first of all, you create like just this helper to deploy behaviors. This is just an object with some uh, pure methods. Then you define, uh, th so th th uh, this is, um, I won't be able to explain everything here. This is just a sample, but uh, I'll sh later I'll show you where you can get more information on that if, if you want. So basically here we uh, define a way how to, give an, a an ID of a booking, how you get uh, an instance of uh, this booking algebra uh, with a like it's, it's it has some special effect which uh, I also don't have time to describe but uh, basically this is uh, uh, yeah, yeah this is uh, some uh, internal ACOR API that uh, 
build, builds everything together. So you supply it a uh, an instance of the algebra. This this is just like the algebra we just seen. This booking algebra, an instance of that. Uh, then like, like a, a constructor of that. Yeah. Then you supply it a journal because it's a runtime already. Where we are. Uh, concerned with this infrastructure, and uh, you can also supply if you want the snapshotting strategy. Uh, this like event sourcing, uh, snapshots in event sourcing is a like is a concept. Yeah, so you can do that as well. Mm. And then you deploy it with this run behavior. So this thing uh, uh, gives you. Th this is a type alias which I will not expand, but uh, I'll explain it to you in plain words. So. This thing is a function. Uh, you supply it a, an ID of a booking, and and it gives you back an instance of this booking algebra. Uh, so by calling methods on this instance, you can issue commands to this entity. So when you call, for example, this expire handler, this sends uh, a command to ACA sharding and underlying sharding to the cluster. Uh, using wire protocol, it encodes the command and sends it to the node that uh, uh, can, like runs this particular entity. So they are sharded over the cluster. You might need to send the command to the other node. It, using wire protocol, it sends the command to that node. Then um, uh, this node processes uh, the command. It uh, it might write some events to the journal, right? Uh, and it encodes response with wire protocol back to the original node that received the request where where the call happened, and and you as a caller of the method just get this value uh, from that node like in in f. Just like basically this thing like you just call a method and receive back a result. And under the hood, every, all this magic happens like in the cluster. So this is really nice API to this really complex thing. Uh, you can view it as a kind of gateway. So you supply it an ID, and it gives you an instance that, an instance of this gateway to the entity that allows to easily run commands, uh, 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 like over over your cluster. So you can specify some sharding settings here, uh, number of shards, uh, passivation timeout, all that stuff that is uh, used to configure uh, ACA cluster, uh, ACA sharding. Yeah, that, that's basically it. Uh, to like s highlight some things, uh, ACA cluster is under the hood, but there is some work in progress to get a stateless uh, runtime without, like, like the, the, with consensus pushed to the database. Uh, so you, we will probably see some different runtimes in the future. Uh, serialization is type safe with using implicits. Uh, wire protocol is provided by uh, macros. Using S codec and Bupico. Uh, journals are really flexible in ACOR, so to compare it with ACA persistence, you usually have a big table with events where all the entities store all of the events. Here you are really flexible, you can supply uh, different tables or even different database en engines for each entity. So this, is, uh, this allows, gives you more freedom in that regard. And as I said, really nice API. So to execute a command, you just call a effectful method and get result in the effect. That's it. Uh, a little, a little, just a little about secure asset distributed processing. Excuse me. Uh, so. Uh, in the in the root of SecureS, uh, there is one thing to do SecureS. You need uh, it's a stream of events. So you get all your entities they store events in the journal. You need to stream them uh, on your read side to build projections to, be, to build views. Uh, the API on the surface looks really like uh, the ACA persistence one. So you get events by tag, you supply the tag, and you get a stream of events. Uh, but uh, Acor First of all, it gives a functional API, so the streams are FS2. Uh, the, uh, everything is uh, polymorphic in effect, as I said. And uh, if you supply your journal an offset store, which is just a key value store where a, a consumer can store its progress over the stream, uh, then you can supply a consumer ID, and your events will be wrapped into a thing called committable, which will have a hook that allows you to store your progress. So a, a consumer, your projection, for example, it receives an event. It processes it, and when it finished processing, it calls the commit hook, and it just updates the offset in the offset store. So it looks kind of like uh, Kafka, but uh, you don't have to commit an offset to get in, uh, the next event. That's that's it. Uh, and uh, as I said, everything is purely functional. You can like you. 
uh, everything is suspended, nothing runs, as you call it, everything runs at the top of the world. A uh, couple of words about tagging. So um, tagging allows you to partition your stream of your events uh, the way you want. So you have a lot of booking, bookings, right? Each booking stores its events. Uh, you have them all in one journal. Uh, tagging allows you to um, partition uh, like uh, the, these events into several streams. Uh, the simplest tagging scheme is constant, where you m mark all the events with a single tag. Then, you, uh, in this case, you get a single stream. So all of your events are in a single order stream. Uh, in case this is not scalable enough for you, you can partition in like, I don't know, 10 tags or more, uh, as much as you want. In this case, you'll get uh, 10 different tags, booking one, booking two, booking three, and you can run 10 streams. You can run them in parallel to get more uh, speed, right? To, to process them in parallel. Uh, uh, the partitioning is done uh, similar to Kafka. It's, it, it's by hash of the key, of the entity key. So. Um, each entity, all of its events, uh, always uh, appear in the same stream. So you can, like, the consistency boundary is not lost. Um, yeah, and but uh, so you have these 10 streams. You have to deploy the, them somehow onto your cluster, right? Uh, you don't want to um, have your stream stopped because if one node is down or you don't want to have duplicates of your streams. You have like you you want to have exactly one stream for each tag. Uh, you need consensus, and the distributed processing is at your disposal. So for each tag, you can create a process, which is basically a, a recipe to run the stream. Um, yeah, you run your stream through some projection. It doesn't matter what. Uh, in this example, um, yeah, and then you create, uh, you deploy, start this process in the distributed processing, and it just uses ACA sharding to distribute your streams over the cluster in, in, a, in a fault tolerant way. Yeah, the same way as entity actors are sharded. Um, and in, in return, you get a kill switch if you want to end your processes for some reason, like earlier, right? Uh, you can just call this kill switch, and, and the processes will be killed. Um, and you can use this processing for any kind of computations. So you, it's, it's not uh, limited to projections to CQRS. You can, I don't know, deploy some, just w some workloads there and uh, get results. Um, yeah, and as I said, it uses Aqua Cluster under, under, under the hood as well. So to, to summarize, uh, recently I just, uh, used all of that, all of, all, the, all of those goodies to build a new service. It was like a medium-sized service that had uh, several Kafka connections. It had several endpoints. It uh, talked to other services using HTTP as well. It had a couple of event-sourced entities. Yeah, and all of that was written like completely final tagless style. So I just had one hole at the top to fill in. And when I did that, it felt just so good. I don't know, it's, uh, it's a perfectionist heaven, I would call that. It, it was really nice. And uh, Acor makes, makes this really possible and simple uh, to, like, to, like, I don't know, this uh, dream of functional programmer in Scala to, have ever, to write everything in an like, abstract effect and then fill this hole at the top. So uh, yeah, and I just uh, want you all to try that. Uh, this is this is a really nice feeling. I don't know. I, I want to experience this more. If you want in-depth coverage on this topic, so I, I uh, obviously I didn't have time to cover all the details. There are a lot of great things, a lot of trick, th tricky things, a lot of gotchas. So I welcome you to my blog. There is a blog post series on on this framework on not, like on this library, not framework. Uh, yeah, this is a good entry point. I will share the slides, uh, slides later. Um, yeah, and that's probably it. I wish you all a great conference uh, today and tomorrow. And thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please raise your hands. We will pass microphone to you if you have any questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have microphone, yeah? Hi, I have two questions. Yep. Uh, one of them is about this new type class that's introduced in ICOR, which is monad something something something. Yeah, there there are several type classes. It, it, it's just a mix of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, what I was going to say is there are simply a smaller type classes in CATSMTL, which probably look like they could be used instead of this one. Uh, you are right. Let's go back. If you look at the signatures, uh, they uh, resemble uh, monad state. Mo monad, uh, yeah, this applicative ask, I think. Uh, yeah, so this, this all is a combination of a reader, uh, um, a reader and writer, and yeah, something like that. Uh, and funct arrays, perhaps. Yeah, and funct arrays, right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, correct. Um, the design choice is uh, explicit because this is this thing is kind of it's for um, it has a little bit different semantics in the sense of like how how would you reason about that so uh, to answer your question y yes you can replace these with the cats of cats uh, MTL type classes and it would work I guess yeah so would they satisfy the laws of cats oh. MTL type class? I, I don't know what, what was the what would be the benefit <laughs> like uh, um, I don't know like it's uh, it's the it was the choice of uh, the library developer Denise yeah so you should probably ask him I I don't have any problem with that because um, this is uh, kind of specifically about event sourcing and uh, it, if if you would. I don't know. So the append would look like uh, what, like uh, how it's called in the writer. This uh, tell. tell, yeah. So it's uh, the naming would have to be different, and this I, don't, I think this would be wouldn't feel right. So uh, the raise raise also wouldn't fit properly. So you usually the comment comes in and you reject it. So you don't like raise any kind of error. So you just like say, okay, I don't want this comment to happen. No error happens in your system. So this is kind of just to have more the cl closer semantics, I think, like the readability. Yeah. Okay, my other question would be about Scala.js. Can you use this library on a front end to communicate to a server? Uh, you can use uh, behaviors you can use. There is actually a pull request that already compiles it to Scala.js. Uh, about the runtime, I think no, because it, it requires consensus and you probably don't want to run a cluster on the front end. Uh, but yeah, the behaviors, easily, you can compile it and uh, no, word, no, no problems with that. So you can share your domain logic between yeah. front you. and back end. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, good. Uh, I, I have a question similar to the previous one. It's regarding um, extension of Monad. Why uh, do these type classes extend uh, monad rather than using um, the so-called scatter encoding for type class uh, hierarchy. Y y you probably know about the problem. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, Have you ever encountered any issues with extending monad rather than having it as a member? This this thing is used in in a strictly uh, the context of writing this event sourced interpreters. And you usually don't have any other effects. Like so, you, the problem is when you have uh, several like constraints, right? And they like clash. So usually in this context, you don't get that that problem. So I guess you could you could uh, encode it in different way. It's just the use case uh, doesn't like really have any problems with uh, this uh, old kind of encoding when you extend money directly. Okay. So, fair point. Do you have other questions? Okay, well, let's then say, say thank you to Vladimir for thank his you very presentation. Much. Thanks.